Gina Lopez, thank you so much for coming on the Aaron Addison podcast. I pr- really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited. Oh. Sounds like it. <laughs> anyway, we were talking before we went live, but my question is, Inner Addison is about your greatest confidence come from your greatest defeats. And my mm-hmm. question to you was, do, do you have any? And your, your answer was burnout. And you started to get into it, but I'd like to take you from that, right, you know, from there and go a little bit more. Yeah. So I'm going to bring you back, I would say, at least three or four years ago, actually. So I've been in this I've been in this online business game for a while now, but um, what's, what's, I, what's, what's a while? Because you got to be like, what, 23, 24. Um, so I actually had my business when I was in college. So I had a coaching business, did really well. Um, and so how did, you, how did you and let's go there. Who did yeah. you coach when you were 18 to in call, you know, in college? And please, I'm not if I come off like an ass, I'm not trying to. I'm Good. just trying to understand. OK, so. yeah. OK, so then I guess it's good to even bring me back bring you back even further so i came from i always had a business whether it was elementary school high school whatever in high school i had a henna business and we did events street festivals we did an event at google we did bridal parties everything like that i originally you know knew how to get sales from marketing knew how to do that and originally i thought to myself like hey i should help henna artists and then i realized very early on that henna artists don't really want to do this as a business they want to do this as a hobby and I was like well I love the coaching space and I love like helping people and I know how to get sales and clients through social media like let me see if I can help like life coaches as an example and so for at least two years I was like helping mindset coaches life coaches anything within that space helping them get their first clients and really start their business and really leveraging social media marketing to you know make their first ten thousand dollars fifteen thousand dollars and so on right and so that was a great run in terms of like I actually legitimately like I had a client and she came to me and she's like, she was charging $50 for a group coaching program. And I was like, no, let's not do that. <laughs> and so by the end of us working, working together, she was actually charging $3,000 plus and she was actually signing on clients, doing sales calls and actually, you know, having a whole business. And it was very rewarding to see that. And so I had, you know, as a coach, it's always great to have a coach yourself. So I, you know, fell into the traditional advice of like, you know, when you have a coaching business, you should do sales calls, you should pretty much do everything in the business. And it was, it was a lot in the sense of like, you know, it it can be great money, it can be very lucrative, like to bring in thousands of dollars a month as a college student, like, that's not, uh, that's not common, right? Especially among my peers. And I was doing that. But they don't tell you like the cost in terms of like the time and the energy that comes behind the scenes, right? And so what I mean by that is like doing everything from the constant sales calls, from the actual coaching cell calls itself to the customer support to the marketing. Like I was a one person business for a while and then I hired a team, a bunch of virtual assistants to help me out. And then that that was great. But then that, then I started becoming a manager and I didn't really like that aspect of the business. Like I, I was just like, I just want to serve clients, but there's just so many other layers of this business that I just didn't want to do. And it was ironic actually when I had this, you know, this failure, I would say I considered it a failure was, um, I made the most amount of money in my business within one specific month. And I was like, wow, like, that's pretty cool. Didn't like, I've always wanted this. And I, my mindset coach at the time, she called it a money hangover. And if you're not familiar with the money hangover, it's essentially where you chase money for so long. The moment you get it, you just kind of want to get rid of it because you're so used to not having that the moment you do have, it seems foreign and you just want to go back to reversion to the mean of what you're used to of, of not having it. Right. And so I did not credit what got me there was actually working less. Like literally like I was about to give up for a while and I was like, I said, screw it. Like, let me just work less and just if it happens, it happens. Right. It was a lot more calm at that time when I made that decision and I made more money than I ever thought. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. But I did not credit that it was the working less part that actually got me there where I was like actually in flow and I worked harder. 
and I was like oh like again that fear of like I won't get there again I have to keep pushing 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 and then I had 20 sales calls probably back to back and every single one of them said no and I was like what the hell is this like I know how to close sales I've closed multiple six figures in sales like I know how to do this like why is this not working right and I just kind of realized I hopped in a call with my coach at the time and she said she's like are you burnt out and I was like what is that like what do you mean burnt out like describe that to me and so she was explaining it to me and I was like oh is that what I've been feeling like I didn't know that that was like a legitimate thing. And so it was almost like her telling me that that was a thing almost gave me the permission to allow myself to even feel that. And then once when I recognized it from like in my system perspective, like it was just almost overwhelming, consuming, like I could not get out of bed and it was like hard. And I was just like, I only had the energy to serve my clients at the time and finish out my coaching contracts. And I said, I actually said to them, I was like, I'm not accepting any new clients. It's pretty easy to close a coaching business. You just stop accepting clients. I only had the energy to serve out my current clients that I had. And that was that. And so I took a four month mental health sabbatical and I just, that, that's all I had to, that's all I had. That was literally, I just healed and did a lot of therapy, did a lot of like self-exploration and all these things. And I kind of realized like, you know, once you're an entrepreneur, it's really hard to like not do anything. And as much as I gave myself enough time, like I, I really missed business, but I didn't want to come back to a business that had all those things. And that's when I decided coaching is not something that I want to do anymore. Like I love it, but I don't love all the energy behind it. Um, and I was like, how do you still solve and still serve at a high level to a mass amount of people without having a ton of calls in your calendar and that's when I was like oh content creation like that's that's pretty cool like writing on medium like the internet like let the internet do its thing and so that's where three years ago I decided to write on medium build my audience over there and like it's the internet's very humbling right like you literally everybody has to start from zero all your big creators that you love now they all start from zero And so that's where I restarted the business and I was like, okay, I'm going to teach everything that I know from everything I've learned into content creation. And so I made the deal with myself where like, if we're going to do this business, there's a couple of non-negotiables. One of them is no sales calls. I don't like client cash injections. Like it's great because it is a cash injection, but it is unsustainable because every single month you're searching for a client. And so my alternative is daily passive income streams. How do I, you know, ramp those streams up? Second one is I don't want a large team. I'm honestly good with myself and one virtual assistant. We're, we're doing pretty smooth sailing, right? And the last thing is I want it to be completely automated. So I come from an automation and tech background as well. And so I love no code and I'm like, how can I really automate at least in 80% of the business and have the um, VA take the remaining 15 and I only work on five so that I can take a month off, still make money and not worry about showing up for anything. And I did that last year. I took a month off to travel Asia with my family and came back. The business did really well. And yeah, the rest is history. So uh, is there a certain niche you specialize in? So for me, I help creators build an automated content business because, you know, one of the things that I noticed is there are a lot of big gurus in the space that will say like, oh, I have everything completely automated, but done, right? But like majority of the time they have a big VA team or they have a large um, agency behind them that helps them run the show. My thing is how can you build an automated content business where you're not the bottleneck but still be profitable and not have a large amount of overhead. And this is where I leverage no code, email marketing, affiliate marketing, and all the strategies that I figured out. And when people don't understand, so somebody listening to this, they're not going to understand what no code. <laughs> yes. I want to explain that for them. Not everybody's going to understand. So no code is essentially like you have your coders, right? They like mm-hmm. write a bunch of code and they can build websites. They can build bots, automate stuff. Basically, no code is you can still get all the outcomes of what coders can do but you do not need to code yourself like i don't i don't code at all 
um i know a little html but like besides like paragraph tags and stuff like that i don't know anything beyond that and so basically if you're looking into examples of really great no code tools that allow you to accomplish the same thing as what you would hire a coder for but not actually code is would be like bubble is really good for websites or zapier would be really good for like automating things airtable is really good for like database and automations as well so essentially it's like if you want to become a no coder what it has allowed me and other people to do is it allows them to still be able to like think creatively where like you still want an outcome but you don't let technology hold you back to get there gotcha all right so you automate so it sounds to me like all you've done and this is not coming off wrong i hope uh is you, basically you do five percent of your business the rest of it's done by automation and the va is that correct yeah. is that what That's i heard right. okay and then so how long did it take you to get there it took me three years i will not hide that a lot of people say oh it's overnight people think it's an overnight success literally Nothing's overnight <laughs> no <laughs> so for somebody else can you do it much faster for them yeah. So I'll give an example of the three areas that I think is really key to building an automated content business. When you think about a creator, whether you're a creator or even a coach, as an example, anyone who creates content is in some ways a creator, right? Mm -hmm. There, The sheer amount of content that you need to do in order to get an ounce of recognition is ridiculous. And so I... I'm not trying to come off salesy or what's that whatsoever, but I created something called our daily content generator. Mm -hmm. It's literally $9. And there's a reason for that. Basically what this daily content generator does is if you're a creator, you probably have a whole library of content that is going stale and is like, does not see the light of day after it's posted. Right. It'd be a shame if it went to waste. So what this daily content generator does is it automatically pulls a random piece of content within the source library, it leverages AI and automation to repurpose that content to Instagram Reels, to Facebook, to YouTube Shorts, to Twitter threads, to LinkedIn posts, all these things. And it's an automation that you embed into your business. And then it goes every single day, literally, hence the name, a daily content generator. That's one aspect where it's like, if you want to automate your content repurposing, because content repurposing takes a large chunk of your time, because mm -hmm. you could create content once, but to repurpose it is like, oh my God, it's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing where I, where I tell creators, I'm like, you got to automate that because that will give you at least 20 hours of your time back per, per week, right? The second thing is lead gen, right? Every business has lead gen, whether it's like getting sales calls or, you know, building an email list, however you see, you know, your, your channels to make revenue, right? For me, it's like email list. And so I'm a big believer <laughs> And it's ironic as a content creator, but how do you grow your lead pool without relying on social media? Social media is great, but it's unsustainable in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's very risky from the perspective of like, as an example, actually a couple of days ago, my account accidentally got flagged for a spam filter and I had to reach out to customer service to say like, hey, what is wrong here? And they're like, oh, it was an accident. Sorry. Like we restored everything. That is not a position that you ever want to be in. Right. Especially if you spend three plus years building an audience on social media with the click of a button, it can be gone. Right. And your business mm -hmm. is gone. And so this is where we leverage strategies like collaborations. How do you automate your pitching, your promotion and those collaborations? And I have a course that talks more in depth on that because it's solving the problem of like automating your lead gen so you can add hundreds of email subscribers without having to post on social media. And then the last piece is monetizing and automating the nurturing and monetizing. And this is where you get into like email automation. If you want to make daily sales in your business, you need to do daily selling. For you to do daily selling, you could take the route of daily sales calls. I that's not enough. That's that's a no for me, right? So this is where email comes into play. And a lot of people think that email is dead, but it's not. No, this is where you can automate your selling via email. And so that's exactly what we do. No texting. I have been debating texting. 
Seriously. I, see, for me, I would, and just so you know, so I own a mortgage company, so I get like 600 emails. I have another email that's for this. I, uh -huh. And I'm starting to get 300 emails a day, right? Oh There's just goodness. no way to go through it. And you could have an assistant go through it, but it's, it's worthless. It's just, I, my main one is I wait for one of my staff to go, did you see that email? And then I go find the email. That's how much <laughs> it is. So that, but it's, so for me, right? I wrote a book called Financial Freedom, Building Personal Wealth Through Homeownership. I'm told mm -hmm. I need to create a course on that. I also need to create a course on podcasting. It's just so much. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, uh, oh, just uh, it's easy. Just watch this thing. You can. And it's like, no, I need someone to tell me what to do and how to do it or how, at least break it down for me. I'm great at creating content. I'm great mm -hmm. at talking to people on the phone. That's I've done that for years. I have the right voice for it. Other people don't have the right voice for it. Mm -hmm. I do really well by that. You don't like that. I thrive off of that. Mm -hmm. Follow me. There's the difference, which is that's OK, but I wouldn't mind making those sales calls. I don't mind getting a no. Because if I, I have to get so many no's to get a yes, I've learned that years ago. Yeah. Um, but I've been in sales a lot longer than you have. I, I've been on, the, I've probably been on this earth at least twice as long as you've been. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, but whatever works for you and, and that's what you've done, you've automated. And that's what I've learned over the last three years, especially year and a half, how our business got destroyed because of and this is not trying to get political, but because of interest rates went so high that mm -hmm. passive income is so important to have nothing tied to where you have to work every day to get that income. And that's my plan to, in, to get more of that. But and I've done a lot of affiliate marketing, but it still takes time. It's yeah. not overnight. No, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, this is a three year process. Now, granted, like I've created courses and content and all that stuff so that you can shorten that timeline because that anything that you invest in training wise like it should shorten time like my biggest thing is like time is the one asset you can never get back you can make money but it's an interesting thing that you say like like just the differences in like our businesses right like just between you and i like i think that's so important because not every business like you should not ha want to like how do i say this People should question the business model in the sense of, is it the right fit for you? And the reason why I say that is because when I did coaching, I was very, I was like a sponge. Like I, like I invested in coaches and they told me like, Hey, like have a whole team of VAs. I did that. Have a whole shit ton of sales calls. I did that. Get appointment setters. I did that. All that stuff. But then I realized, and it took me burnout, to smack my head so hard against the pavement. Like, I don't want that. And this is why it took me three years to figure this out for what I want now. But it works really well for me. And I was actually just on a call. They're like, Tina, like, why don't you do calls? And I'm like, because I just don't want to. And that is a fair enough statement. Like, you can still accomplish your goals, but it may not be the same way that people, that another person does not And it's not supposed to be the same way. It's supposed to be your way. And that's okay. And, and actually, it's an age thing. I mean, it's just how you guys look at things differently than people older than you have looked at things. And that's not a bad or good thing. That's just how things have, because of how the, is it's, if you go back to the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, each of those 10 years, those people are totally different than the next 10 years. And then 10 years after that, because of the things that have happened mm -hmm. and you're in the situation where you, you're doing with what you want. That's, that's how, that's how it should be. Mm -hmm. Right. People are now going, I need to know I have to have affiliate marketing. I have to have passive income. I have to have all this stuff so that I don't have to rely on anything. Yeah. I mean, I came from a finance background, like my degrees in finance, like diversification is literally how you de-risk your position. And so having multiple income streams is literally how you de-risk any reliance on one. Right. But a lot of people hear that, but never do anything about that. I think the thing is, is like you want to create an ecosystem that feeds off of one another. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, for me as a creator, like I could do coaching. I don't want to. So I have to think about what are the passive income streams that work well for me. And I say passive because it's a hot button word, but like I would like to say it's more leverage. You put in time and then over time you get money uh in the long run but what's important is like you can diversify your 
your income streams, but you want to make sure they work together. And so what I mean by that is like for me, I have content. I have a content business. I create traffic, all that stuff. The whole goal for me is create content, have it go to the email list. But the moment that a person joins my email list, it touches my first income stream, which is newsletter referrals, right? If I refer someone, it's pretty automated. They sign my email list. They're going to get on a referral button. It's like, hey, do you want to sign up for these email lists as well? Great. I get a couple of dollars for that as well. It's the first thing. And then I'm creating a second thing where it's my, this is a funnel. It's pretty simple, like a limited time offer where the person signs up for the newsletter for us, then they're going to redirect to a specific landing page for one of my digital products, right? They buy the digital product. Great. Now here is the affiliate recommendations that I'm going to recommend that actually work really well with the product. Obviously, I'm a big believer in them because I use them myself and that's why I'm promoting it to you. But do you see how I'm creating an ecosystem where one feeds off of another? I think that's the key piece. People want to do everything, but they are not figuring out how to link them all together so that it becomes easy for you to leverage everything. If you put all your buckets, if you're focusing on too many things, that's where it gets difficult. But if you figure out a way to bring it together, that's how it can make it easy. Right. Because, I mean, when we started this, you, I, you, we, before we went live, you said you do 30 podcasts a year. And this is the 30th. I do 30 a month. Yeah. Shows or whatever I, a month. Because I do a daily Monday through Friday live regarding real estate and finance with my co-host. from Because I also do a radio show. I'm all over in everything that's going on. And I'm talking about building. I have so much content. Mm-hmm just so much content and to have it actually cut up and do everything else to do with it is is a lot oh yeah this is why the daily content generator would be best for you <laughs> yeah but it's got to be recent stuff it can't be long-term stuff so my yeah, stuff is yeah. more current stuff that was the thing about mm -hmm. when i had it with a bunch of people cutting it up it took them weeks right to get it yeah. back to me and by then it's all it's outdated because the evergreen stuff of what we talk about on a daily basis there is no evergreen yeah however can we imagine. can create we can create an evergreen stuff like you know the the generic stuff but because of what we talk about and because i'm on uh, talk radio um that it's it's all about what's going on right now yeah i i give you mad kudos because i that yeah. like the industry is constantly changing so the fact that you're keeping up with all that content is just it's, well i mean i get because of cast magic opus opus clips all those different things that have come out with ai now makes it so easy to do so much mm -hmm. you know but it and it's again finding the right vas to help you yeah and yeah. you you don't want to you said you didn't want a team but some of us need that and mm -hmm. what some of us that are not your age are like god you know how do i find the right va that's not gonna you know mess us because you i we get all we get so much hit me and another guy from everybody trying to help us and help us with SEO and help us all that. And you're like, really? We're so, you, we heard so many, you know, bad things that we're going, okay, how do you find the right people? Mm. Yeah. I think like when it comes to finding the right people, cause I, I, I have a virtual system right now. I mean, I, I kept her for my last business, so she helped me. But like when I was looking for a virtual assistant, I think it's a two part, right? Like, yes, part of it is finding the right person. The second part is also making sure you're doing a really good job as a boss in the sense of like, are you creating training materials? Do you have any SOPs? Are you creating any documents? Like if you're not going to provide the training to help your staff, then it's also not fully your staff's fault. So that's where like it's just as much as it takes for you to find a virtual assistant, you also need to show up for them as well. Right. But a lot of people go, well, I want one that knows how to cut up content and do this and do this, do this. And I don't want to have to train them because I don't have time for that. I get what you're saying. Yeah. This is where then you pay the premium of hiring an agency, right? You either you can't have cheap and like it. I know but a, some agencies are ridiculous. I had an agency and it was ridiculous after, you know, things changed in my industry and I took it over and I was like with some of the AI stuff. I could do better content mm -hmm. than them. I went viral, not trying to go viral. They never had. And it was, again, I understand what you're saying and I'm not knocking because it will work. It's just, I'm in a unique situation. I have five different podcasts, including radio. 
Mm -hmm. so, plus all the other stuff I cut up. So, I mean, we the content I do cut up goes crazy, but it's finding you're right, the right person to do it. And I understand you need to explain to them how you want it cut up, how you want this done. But, you know, but again, how do you find that first VA for somebody? How did you find your first VA? Upwork. Honestly, oh. like I, I, I do a couple of things. So first is because it's been a while since I've hired through Upwork. So forgive me, but um, it's okay. No, I just asked. It doesn't matter if you still currently, because I mean, there's a lot of places there's online jobs. There's on, you know, there's so many different places now. I mean, the thing is, is like, I remember when I was hiring a VA, like, first of all, I want to make sure they're reading the whole description of the job. So I put a keyword in the description where it's like, if you read through this part, make sure you send this like jerk chicken and keyword in the in the pro in, in my messages in your proposal or whatever and anyone who did actually read the description fully anyone who didn't i completely disregarded so that's like testing the one thing of like hey kid are you do you pay attention to details the second thing that i also did was like i legitimately did interview them and i paid for like a test case where it's like hey i need you to do this how would you do it or an even better question is like, if I'm not available and we have this problem in the business, what would you do? The questions I'm looking for is I'd look up on Google. That's the first start. Or I'd figure this out. And so having like and you could you could pay anyone to do something, but mm -hmm. you it's really hard to find someone who can think, which is not meant to sound mean, but like truthfully, like finding someone who can think and be resourceful and think on their feet that is where the value is in paying them because then the goal is you want them to essentially be an owner like they're the owner of their responsibilities and tasks but hey they're also going to help figure it out and if they figure it out great you don't need to like nobody likes to be micromanaged i don't like to micromanage my virtual assistant i'm like this is the problem i need you to figure it out and she comes to the solutions and i pick the one that i think is best yeah but you've been working with her for a while right uh i worked with her a couple years ago and then recently i just hired her back on so i would say month two since bringing her back oh really wow yeah full-time part-time part-time because like automations cover 80 percent of things well if she needs somebody for the other part-time have her call me <laughs> yeah i'm saying you're laughing but that's when they say if you're going to get a assistant a va either hire them full-time or hire them part-time and then you're if you really like them and need to hire them for full-time they're not available mm. because they're only working part you know what i mean they pick up other people for the difference in the part-time and i get that um but you gotta do what you gotta do to get by in your business these days but that's the same with us i mean i i do really well in my industry and and from all the stuff i do but even doing with what i do it's getting more challenging every month so. mm-hmm all right what else well um i mean did you talk so you came up with courses yes. how long did it take you to create the course or how did you come up with the idea how did you come up with how to put the course together okay so i'm going to backtrack a little bit okay. i think the better question is how did i sell it how did this all come to be so for me um I'm trying to think of the first course I created. The first course I created was your first $100 as an affiliate marketer. I really love affiliate marketing. It's great. It's very positive. However, I do see a lot of garbage content on how people go about it. And so I remember, this is this is my strategy, where I did come from the background of launching, and I hate launches. I hate launches because it's just so much energy intensive, and I just, I'm very like, let's just low chill, see what happens. Right. And, but I'm also a big believer in pre-selling. And so what I mean by pre-selling is I will not create a product if people do not buy it first. And this does a couple of things. First, it validates the idea. So many people create courses, products, whatever, even physical products, and they do not validate if the market even wants it. Right. And then they end up having either huge inventory or a course that never sees the light of day. Right. And so I, also, one of my strategies to grow my email list is through bundles. And so if you're not familiar with bundles, it's essentially a way where I contribute a product for free to a bundle. Everybody promotes the bundle and people get access to it, right? And I grow my email list that way, as an example. I share this for context. But when people are growing my email list, right, it is a checkout page, but then there's an order bump, 
right? An order bump of like, hey, do you want to add to your order? And so I just decided on a fluke as a random idea. I'm like, well, what if I just did the pre-sell through the order bump? And like, I just wrote it out and I was like, little, like literally maybe it was like five sentences. And I was like, this is my pre-sell. This is the outcome that I would like to do. And this is what you get. That's it, right? And since it's a pre-sell, I gave exclusive pricing for the order bump. And what that did is allowed me to test cold traffic because I don't know these people on the uh, from the bundles. And so I have a goal, like a validation goal in terms of like, if I, oh, if I hit an X number of sales, I'll make the course. If I don't, then I'll refund all their money, right? And, I, and, I, and I'd say it in the language for the order bump. And then I went on vacation and then I came back and I was like, oh shit, like there was actually pre-sales. So that is a really good low key pre-sell strategy where you can not only grow your email list, but you can also pre-sell and validate ideas. So I have the three courses where, like I mentioned, your first hundred dollars is for the marketer, audience profits, and our nine dollar daily content generator. Those were all pre-sells, meaning that people paid me upfront before I created the course. Now, once hold on, when I hold on, what's successful pre-sell? What's a successful pre-sale? Yeah, meaning how much? I mean, how many orders? That kind of stuff. What What do you go for? I, it really depends on you. Like for me, like I set a number in my mind in terms of sales, not not revenue number. I didn't say revenue, just sales. Yeah, I'm talking about like, sales. Yeah. So for for some people, it could be 50 sales. For some people, it could be 20 sales. It really depends on what is a good enough number of students that makes you feel like I'm good enough to go through that. So. I can't give you a number because that changes on every person, right? So I have my I asked number. what was your number? Oh, my number? My number was like 20. Because I'm asking what was your number for these each of these courses to see if it's a good deal to move forward. So. I'll give you an example with a $9 daily content generator. My goal was 10. By the end of the pre-sale, I had 40. So that was super successful. Um I also give a timeline of like two months in terms of like the pre-sale period, but with the $9 daily content generator, that, that already happened within like two weeks. And I was like, oh, 40 students got it. And now we're at over, over 135 plus students who are now in the course, last I checked. Um, so again, it depends on your number. But for me, that was an example. So what you're saying is pre-sell your stuff to see if people want it before mm -hmm. you create it. Essentially, yeah. And you yeah. save yourself a lot of time, energy, and heartache, honestly. Now, when you have the course, a really good strategy is because you gave pre-sale pricing, you should want to have uh, an ideal price. So an example is um, I have a $97 course, which is your first $100 as an affiliate marketer or audience profits as an example. When I did the pre-sale, they probably got it like for $47 as like an idea, right? Did not create the course. But I told them, you know, I'll by a certain date, <clears throat> excuse me, by a certain date, I'll let you know if the pre-sale was successful. So you hit the date. I sent an email saying this is successful. Hey, by the way, what would you want me to include in this course as well? Like, I, here's my general outline, but like, I would love to include you in the process, right? And so this is great because I get feedback, but I can also use it for marketing where I can say for the people who didn't buy, hey, I have 20 plus students that bought this pre-sale and they are telling me that they want this and this is what I'm going to include in the course. And I just like document the journey. It's kind of like building in public, if you will. Um, and I'll say to them, hey, this course is going to be X price by the end of it when I actually release it. You might want to buy it now, right? Or you might want to buy it at this new price. And so it was funny, like I would do progress updates weekly. And every week I'd actually raise the price like stair steps. So say, for example, I'm going from 47 to $97 every week. I'd be like, oh, we're going to add like $20 to this price. And that drives natural urgency where people like oh. want to buy it. And then by the time the course has finished its final price, then that's when the actual like validation, the course is complete because now I'm actually delivering a course at its final price and it's completely done. And then I just repurpose all my emails that I've sent as the weekly like price hikes. I just repurpose them and I put them in an email sequence so I can evergreen it, meaning that if people join my email list at any point in time, they'll get the same set of emails at any point in time in the future. And then that's that's the strategy. 
No, I just like, that's the best idea of re checking to see if somebody wants your course in the first place because most people don't do that. I know. I've seen it happen way too many times and I'm like, oh my God, please don't do it. Don't do it that way because people, it's kind of like, I don't know how to put this in a nicer way, but it's like you kind of have to change your mindset of employee versus business owner. As an employee, you tend to get paid when you do the work first. And as a business owner, you want to get paid first before you do the work, right? And so you kind of have to shift in the sense of like, no, I'm going to get paid first and then I'm going to do the work versus if you came from the employee mindset, you would do the work and then hopefully get paid. But most people don't because they didn't do the validation. Now, on your first one, you did it through a, through the email thing, the, the bundle. Is mm -hmm. that how you did your other two or did you just have it on social media? No, I did it through the bundle. I did it all through email. I did not post anything on social. It was just pure email because like I said, like anyone who joins my email list first will always get first dibs on everything. That's the benefit of being on my email list. But B, I also do not want to depend on sales from some from a medium that I cannot control, which is social media. Email I can control. So right. no, but there's do. nothing wrong with adding it and getting them over to yeah. your email list to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, do you bump up? when you're doing your, so your pre-sales, is there something else in there? Just like a normal funnel, you added additional stuff or? Um, that really comes into play after I created the course and it's at its full price. Cause then when I evergreen it, when I create the funnel for it, that's when I start adding upsells, downsells and more order bumps. But I want to, I can't, I, I only want to focus on validating the sale first before I add all the bells and whistles. You should do you should do two courses more. I know you already have three, and you're like, I got too many. Uh, you do the email one, how to get people to sign up for emails. Okay, I have that. A lot of people, yeah, do you? I don't. Oh, email marketing. Um, yeah. And, and then the other one would be how to get, how to start your course. Yeah, I uh, I've thought about that. So you're not the first. Just because people are like going, how do I? Just the fact that you said it. This is all right. This is what I want you to do. Start with the first thing. Here's what you do. Send this out. See if people even want it. That alone mm -hmm. is worth you know money right there. Mm -hmm. No, I've definitely, I've definitely thought about doing that. But I'll tell you, like creating a course is a lot of work. It's like a two month at least process. And so I'm good with my three, and then I'll well, add like, more as time goes on. <laughs> I mean, with what people want me to do, it's like, you know, the, cause everybody keeps asking me for the stuff that I do. The one for my real estate, you know, how to buy a home and the other one on, on the podcasting, I keep constantly getting asked to do it again. It's time. It's about how to put it together. But like you said, you can put, easily put together a little quick thing going, okay, I need to know this is what I'm looking to do. And mm -hmm. I need to know if it's, you know, beneficial to you. If so, this is the pre-sale price and whatever else, you know, you can ask them what additional stuff to put in it. Because mm -hmm. I'm constantly talking to people, and they're, and their their setups wrong, everything's wrong. They don't want to do certain things. So, mm. all right, I'll take that into consideration. Thank you. No problem. All right, you know it's been nice talking to you, Tina. Thank you so much. I love talking to you. Thanks. No, it's I, I didn't know how this was going to go because I had no, <laughs> we didn't have a pre talk or anything, and and you know I'm trying, and so it went in a great way because you explain to people how they can do certain things and because people don't always think it's so simple as you've made it i try to go simple and okay. as much as possible i think actually people have a harder time being simple than being complicated and the more you simplify things the better the people try to like overcomplicate the crap out of things and i'm just like no, like, let's go easy. Like, choose the easy route because that's the one that I'm going to choose. Right. But it hasn't always been that way for some of us. Right? Oh, no. Things, <laughs> yeah, today, to, what's what's available today to do stuff is, is, is ridiculous. Where before there wasn't that same stuff. Now it's just so easy to do stuff and, and set things up. Things are constantly changing. I mean, I talked about Opus, you know, clips. That alone you know, and cast magic, those two things were alone. They only came out in the last six months or so, and they've drastically changed things. So. No, I, I love Opus Clip. The one thing that I don't like about Opus Clip, and I hope they change it, 
is that like their logins like it's like you have to go through a whole verification process like i wish i could just have a user and a password yeah but that's only all right but then you don't have to do that every time True. Set a little thing at the bottom click on it once you do it and you, and you might have to do one out of every 25 times going in or I would really love for Opus, and I, I think I put it in their um, roadmap, to have like a Zapier integration. That would be game changer. Like if I can automatically connect to an API, for example, and then I don't have to manually upload anything. I just upload it automatically, and then I get the content automatically, and then I can post it to social media automatically. Right, because there's well, you have to go in the way it is set up now. You have to if you use their internal thing, you have to set it up to go to your stuff. Yeah. It won't, and it's not automatic. You got to, you got to play, you know, schedule it. You have mm -hmm. a VA. I do have a VA, but like, I, you know, you got to pick and choose what you want a person to spend their time on, right? Have more higher important tasks. Right. But, you know, again, how you, how you, the $9 course thing that you talked about, the content where you, it automatically creates that stuff for you, that's, that's pretty good. So thank you. Yeah. So I might be even signing up for that. Yeah, absolutely. And if any of the real inner Edison people out there want to do it, is there a discount code for them? Uh, there is not a discount code because it's already nine dollars, and I <laughs> feel like kidding. that's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was just... Well, there's a person who has a nine dollar course who's made a lot of money. So. Oh yeah, it's like a whole strategy, and I can tell you very honestly, it's been. A very good strategy because it yeah. it solves such a specific problem and price is not a problem <laughs> truthfully and i think that's what it is it's like i created this truly to solve creator burnout i saw so many of my friends burnt out with content creation and i'm like screw this i can't watch this anymore so i created it and then i gave it to them yeah well 29.95 is still a good number too so i know that's my upsell you know <laughs> All right, Tina, how do people find you if they want to find you? So the best way to find me is through our content creators club. So you can go to creatorsclub.tinalopez.com and you can find me, the daily content generator, and all. I have a lot of great resources in my newsletter that my email list gets first before anyone else. All right, Tina, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you having you here today. Thank you so much. Make it a great.